Welcome. Today we are going to address the fifth and final chapter of Philosophical Fragments, The Follower at Second Hand. In chapter five, we turn our attention to the question about the follower at second hand. As he mentioned earlier in chapter four, he says, and according to our hypothesis, 1843 years have intervened between the contemporary follower and this conversation. And therefore, there seems to be sufficient occasion to ask about a follower at second hand, inasmuch as this situation presumably must have recurred frequently. But this question, even in fact, seems an imperative. Likewise, the claim on the explanation of the potential difficulties involved in defining the similarity and difference between a follower at second hand and a contemporary follower. Well, earlier in chapter four, the focus was on what it means to be a contemporary, that being in thought, there still is, for at least our use of conversation, this question about a follower at second hand, somebody who is learning from somebody else, maybe not even the teacher directly, and then maybe subsequently learning from the teacher. And, and how does that work? And this is really the, the purpose of chapter five. He says, despite this, however, should we not first of all consider whether this question is just as proper as it is as close at hand? That is, if the question should prove to be improper, or if one cannot raise such a question without talking like a fool and consequently is without justification in charging with foolishness, someone who is sensible enough not to be able to answer it, the difficulties seem to be removed. Whether or not this question even makes sense, because if we've changed what it means to be a contemporary to being in thought and not in time, does it even make sense to ask the question about being a follower at second hand? Can there be really any followers at second hand? Undeniably, for the question cannot be asked, he says, then the answer causes no trouble and the difficulty has become a remarkably easy matter. But this is not the case, for suppose the difficulty consisted in perceiving that one cannot question in this way, or have you perhaps already perceived this? Was this perhaps what you meant when you had your questions at the end of the last chapter? That you understood me and all the consequence of what I said, although I as yet had not completely understood myself. Are you ahead of me in this conversation? Have you already anticipated some of these questions at the end of chapter four? Yet he continues on the bottom of 89. That was not at all my view. No more than this is my view that the question can be dismissed, even less so because it is promptly possesses a new question as to whether or not a distinction among the many included in the category of follower at second hand, in other words, where, whether it is proper to separate such an enormous time span into such unequal parts, the contemporary period and the later period, you are thinking that it ought to be possible to speak of a follower at fifth and seventh hand, etc. Right? If there's a follower at second hand, or we play a telephone game where now I'm sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, a hundredth down the line of getting this message. But even if, in order to indulge you, this were discussed, would it follow that a discussion of all these distinctions, provided there is no internal discord, right, that we're not discussing it still along these ways, should not be subsumed under the rubric in contrast to the category, the contemporary follower. Does really everything go back to this question of being a contemporary? Or would the discussion proceed properly if it went about things as you did, so that it would be simple enough to do what you were craftily enough to do, namely get the question about a follower at second hand changed into an entirely different question? Because really, this is a different question. This is a broader discussion, right? Whereby, he says, you found a chance to baffle me with my new question instead of agreeing or disagreeing with my proposal. But since you most likely do not wish to continue this conversation, fearing that it'll degenerate in a sophistry and bickering, I shall break it off. But from what I intend to enlarge upon, you'll see that the comments we have just made to each other have been taken into consideration. In other words, as we unfold the rest of this chapter, we're gonna go over these basic questions of, is there a follower at second hand or third hand or fifth or seventh or hundredth? Is there a 
internal dialogue, internal discussion that's keeping some sort of consistency there? Is this a telephone game where you're passing around a sheet of paper as opposed to vaguely hearing what somebody is saying? Uh, and how does this move forward? So this introduces the idea here of, of what we're addressing in chapter five. Probably most important for this endeavor would be to look at the differences amongst the followers at second hand. What difference would it make? How is it that we will see anything? Because if there doesn't seem to be any difference, then pragmatically speaking, what's the difference? Why bother? Here then, he says, we shall not reflect on the relation of the secondary follower to the contemporary follower, but the difference to be reflected upon is of such a kind that the similarity in contrast to another group of those differing among themselves remains. For the difference that is different only within itself remains within the similarity to itself. Here we have a very clear argument about what are differences? What are opposites, right? This distinction that we made a little bit earlier with Hume about how we're going to realize that a, a Welsh or a Flemish horse's size only when we're comparing the two. We're comparing like things to be able to make discussions and distinctions about opposites. And so that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to understand the same group and what's the difference within that as opposed to within broader distinctions. Therefore, he continues, it is not arbitrary to break off wherever one so desires. For the relative difference here is no so rights from which the quality is supposed to appear by a coup de mans, a sudden stroke, since it is within the specific quality. A so rights would eventuate only if to be contemporary were to be made dialectical in the bad sense by showing, for example, that in a certain sense, no one at all was a contemporary, for no one could be a contemporary with all the factors, or by asking when the contemporary entity ceased and when non-contemporary entity began, whether there was not a border territory, a, a division that's going to be made of haggling in which the tentative understanding could say to a certain degree, etc., etc. Now, most of us might have followed the second half of this, but when he's talking about the so rights, you're probably a little confused. And thankfully, we have a little footnote about what a so rights is. The so rights is a compound or chain syllogism that was used by Crispius, a Stoic philosopher. Uh, whereby an opponent is brought by small degrees from the admission of a self-evident truth to the admission of what is not manifestly true. In other words, we're leading you on with an argument, this is like that, and that's like this, and this is like this, and eventually you get to a place that wouldn't necessarily be obvious, but you slowly let ground go, and you transformed into a different sort of argument entirely. And so he's asking, is this what we're doing? Are we trying to suppress the truth and just try to confuse you until you're lost? Are we going to start asking you about what's the difference between a contemporary and a non-contemporary? Or the contemporary is there maybe no contemporary at all because no one can be there in time and place and fully even understand the moment without reflection, which means you're now out of time and therefore there is none of this. And are we trying to confuse and muddle the whole thing. And he's saying he's not trying to do that, thankfully, even though some of you might have been saying, eh, it seems like you're doing that a little bit. Continuing on on the top of 91, he says, all such in human profundity leads to nothing, or in our time may lead to being considered genuine speculative profundity, since the despised sophism has become the miserable secret of genuine speculation. Only the devil knows how it happened. And what antiquity regarded negatively, to a certain degree, has become the positive. And what antiquity called the positive, the passion for distinctions, has become foolishness. We found this sort of twist in how we like to discuss things, is what Kierkegaard is trying to make the argument for here. That what used to just be kind of despised as sophism to go back to our early sophists, uh, an idea that words have hollow meaning, that there's no real truth or wisdom to be found in them, but only kind of a dismissive argument that sounds good, but doesn't 
produce or have any connection with the truth has kind of gained in favor today. At least this was his argument. Yet now, if what we're really interested in is spin, then what was once seen as mockable is now prized and the actual veracity of a claim is no longer as important. Next chapter, or paragraph down on 91, he says, opposites show up most strongly when placed together. We've already encountered this distinction here with Hume and his discussion of the Welsh and Flemish horses. And therefore we choose here the first generation of secondary followers and the latest, the boundary of the given period of 1843 years, bringing us to the modern time, right? And we shall be as brief as possible for we are speaking not historically, but algebraically. And we have no desire to divert or fascinate anyone with the enchantments of multiplicity. Right? We're not trying to say what differences has the time made, but what difference is going to be made in what they're producing and, and what they look like. And therefore that should highlight the most differences. On the contrary, he continues, in and with the difference, we shall remember always to grasp securely the common similarity of the difference vis-a-vis -vis the contemporary entity. Not until the next section, he says, shall we see more specifically of this question of the follower at second hand, essentially understood as, the, as an improper question, hinting already towards what the result of this discussion will be. And we shall also bear in mind that the difference must not mushroom and confuse everything. So thankfully, if nothing else, Kierkegaard's trying to say, I'm not trying to confuse you all, uh, but we're trying to understand these differences and, and what it really means for being a follower. So let us first look at that first generation of secondary followers. So this generation has the advantage of being closer to the immediate certainty of being closer to acquiring exact and reliable information about what happened from men whose reliability can be verified in other ways. The first generation of any secondary followers has the advantage of knowing that first generation, of going and asking them, hey, you were a contemporary, you were there in time, you experienced these things. Are you a reliable figure? Are you a charlatan? Are you a thief and a murderer who's showing no signs of remorse about your actions and claims? Or are you somebody whose life was transformed or has some sort of truth out of this? This immediate certainty we have addressed already in chapter four. To be somewhat closer to it is no doubt deceptive. For the person who is not so close to the immediate certainty that he is immediately certain is absolutely distanced. But if you're not really certain about what's happening here, he's saying you're not really there, you're not really engaged, you don't really know it. Nevertheless, we shall make an appraisal of the relative difference. How high should we appraise it though? It's a very valid question. At what point should we look at the difference in it and how should we appraise it? We can appraise it, however, only in relation to the advantage that the contemporary has. But his advantage, that notion of immediate certainty in the strictest sense, we've already shown in chapter four to be dubious, and in fact, a dangerous concept. And we shall expand upon this in the next section. Suppose there lived in the generation closest to the contemporary generation, a person who combined a tyrant's power with a tyrant's passion. And he had the notion of concerning himself with nothing but the establishment of the truth in this matter. Would he thereby be a follower? You have the power and you have the ability to do something. Does that necessarily make you, if you're trying to understand the truth about something, a follower of this idea? Suppose he seized all the contemporary witnesses who are still alive and those who are closest to them, had them sharply interrogated one by one, had them locked up like those 70 translators and starved them in order to force them to speak the truth. Suppose he most cunningly contrived to have them 
confront one another simply in order to use every device to secure himself a reliable report. Would he then, with the aid of this report, be a follower? Our answer would probably be no. Just because you have the truth of something doesn't mean that you follow the truth. By the way, for those of you unsure what his discussion about those 70 translators was, that was a, a nod to uh, the scribes in Alexandria who translated the Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures, from Hebrew into Greek. There's different accounts of exactly how that happened, but 70 is that distinction there. Would not the God rather smile at him for wanting to obtain under duress in this manner what cannot be purchased for money, but also cannot be taken by force? You can't take the truth from somebody by force, right? This is discussions we have in the modern time about, right? Is torture reliable in getting the truth? Or people just tell you what they need to say to stop being tortured? Or if I bribe you, does that mean that I'm going to get the truth from you? Not necessarily, right? The different people react different ways under different carrots or sticks and what responses you're going to have. Even if the fact which we are discussing were a simple historical fact, difficulties would not fail to arise if he had tried to reach absolute agreement on every small detail. A matter of enormous importance to him because the passion of faith, that is the passion that is just as intense as faith, has taken a wrong turn towards the purely historical. What is instead an issue of faith becomes that of just speculative knowledge. Are you wanting this to make a difference for you or are you just wanting to know a fact? Are you wanting to know which road somebody walked down or is that going to mean something for you? Again, it's about your relation to an object. That's where the value is. And, in, and here we can kind of see some notions of faith are different than just knowledge, but th that it requires action. It requires giving of yourself to this object you're looking at. In many ways, this resembles what Marcus Aurelius uh, and others will talk about the idea of fame. Right? Fame is something put on an object. It's not something that's contained in that object. Faith is something put onto or into another. It's a relational stance. It's not something that that object contains in and of itself. Now, it might be praiseworthy. It might be faith-worthy, but that still doesn't mean that it has faith. Faith is something put into it and onto it. So there is this distinction made as well. He continues here in the bottom quarter or so of the way up on page 92. It is well known that the most honest and truthful people are most likely to become entangled in contradictions when they are subjected to inquisitional treatment and an inquisitor's fixed idea. If somebody's asking you a question over and over again, you're going to kind of wrestle with what you're thinking at the time. And the more honest you are, you're going to say, you know, I was thinking it was this, but you know what? It might have been that. I, I, I'm not sure. And now all of a sudden you're not sure about something you were sure about. right? You don't always hold that up if you're voicing some of your own thoughts and concerns on that. Whereas non-contradiction in one's lies is reserved only for the depraved criminal because of an exactitude sharpened by an evil conscience. People who never change their, their story at all, or everyone walks in with the same story, if you're interrogating you know, the scene of a crime, if everyone's got the same story, that usually is a hallmark of they conspired, they discussed. They've, they've got their story, they've got their lines, and they're sticking with it. They otherwise would have seen things slightly different or in, had different impressions of it, right? So this thing that we're kind of discovering a little bit more recently with criminal court is also something that he's addressing here. But apart from all this fact, the fact of which we speak is indeed no simple historical fact. So what use is it uh, of all this to him if he managed to obtain a complicated report and agreement down to the letter and to the minute? Then beyond all doubt, he would be deceived. He would have a attained a certainty even greater than that of the contemporary who saw and heard, for the later would really discover that he sometimes did not see and sometimes saw wrongly 
And so also, with his hearing, he would be continually having to remind that he did not see or hear the god directly and immediately, but saw a human being in a lowly form, who said of himself that he was the god. In other words, he would continually have to be reminded of this fact was based upon a contradiction. Getting all the historical information about the situation that he's addressing, the god becoming the teacher and, and what this means, would also present the god being low and therefore wouldn't look right. It was itself a, a sort of contradiction, a, a paradox that leads to the paradox of faith. Continuing on 93, would that person be served by the reliability of this report? Viewed historically, yes, but otherwise not. For all talk about the god's physical comeliness, since he was in the form of a mere servant, a simple human being like one of us, the object of offense, all talk about his direct and immediate divinity, since divinity must not uh, is not an immediate qualification. And the teacher must, first of all, develop the deepest self-reflection in the learner, must develop the consciousness of sin and the condition for understanding. Right? This becomes the essential understanding of how you learn if you're going to approach the truth from a non-Socratic point of view. All talk is about the immediate wondrousness of his acts, since the wonder is not immediate, uh, but is only for faith, inasmuch as the person who does not believe does not see the wonder. You have to have wonder and be praiseworthy, be faith worthy for this faith to be there. But yet, it still is dependent upon the outsider to be able to to grant this, to have faith in this object, to have faith at all. All such talk is nonsense here and everywhere. It is an attempt to put off deliberation with chatter. Bottom paragraph on 93. This generation has relatively the advantage of being closer to the jolt of that fact. The jolt and its vibrations serve to arouse awareness. The significance of such awareness has already been appraised in chapter four. Assume then that an advantage to be somewhat closer compared to that of later generations, the advantage is related only to the dubious advantage of the contemporary. So what is really the advantage of being that first generation of secondary followers is you're a little closer to the, those who actually experience the events. But again, getting all of their reports and, and hearing them and being able to weigh it out doesn't necessarily grant you faith. It might not serve as any advantage whatsoever. The advantage, he continues, is completely dialectical, just as the awareness is. It's all about your relation to this object. Whether one is offended or whether one believes, the advantage is to become aware. In other words, awareness is by no means partial to faith. Just because you're aware of something doesn't mean that you have faith in it. You're not granting that object the idea of what it is to be faithful. As if faith proceeded as a simple consequence of awareness. The advantage is that one enters into a state in which the decision manifests itself ever more clearly. This is an advantage, and this is the only advantage that means anything. Indeed, it means so much that it is terrifying, and it is in no way an easy comfort. And the fact that you can be aware of it is an advantage, but it's also one that makes you have to decide. If that fact never fails stupidly and senselessly to the human rut. Every succeeding generation will evince the same relation of offense as did the first, because no one comes closer to the fact immediately, right? This first generation is, it's incumbent upon them to do some of this historical work, because if they don't, at least some of them come to faith, then this is gonna go nowhere. No matter how much one is educated up to that fact, it does not help them. On the contrary, especially if the one doing the educating is already himself well read along these lines, it can help someone to become well-trained babbler in whose mind there is neither suggestion of offense nor place for faith. 
Just because you know everything around it might mean that you're dismissing the idea of wonder in an event. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I kind of understand all of this stuff already. So, yeah, I'm not actually going to marvel at something. Now, sometimes knowing more about how something is done gives you a greater appreciation. Sometimes it means that you're, you know, become calloused to what is wondrous and, and praiseworthy. Moving on to the latest generation, he says, this generation is a long way from the jolt, the main advantage that that first generation has. But on the other hand, it does have the consequences to hold on to as a probability proof of the outcome. You know, there's some veracity to it because it is what has already happened, right? Has directly before it the consequences with which the fact presumably must have been embraced everything. As close at hand, the probability proof from which there nevertheless is no direct transition to faith. Just because it's probable doesn't mean that there is notions of faith, though. Since, as it has been shown, faith is by no means partial to probability. To say that, faith would be slander. So, Kierkegaard is, is making a very distinct and direct argument against Pascal here. Uh, this is more addressed in the footnote that he has on the bottom of page 94 and 95, where he argues against the idea that faith is something that you could wager. Faith is something that you could say is probably the case. Therefore, I'm going to have faith in something. He says, this isn't what faith is. If you're unfamiliar with Pascal and Pascal's wager, uh, watch videos, read about it. It's a very simple, basic argument that argues more or less that you have so much more to gain if there is a god and you have so much more to lose if you don't have faith and there is a god so you ought to side on the side of faith but for kierkegaard the issue of faith is, is not something that's probable it requires a leap that even though mathematically pascal might be correct is this truly faith then, or is this just, you know, making sure that you're okay, right? Is it hedging your bet? But is that, that's not the notion of a leap. This isn't the moment. And so Kierkegaard is having a very direct sort of attack against Pascal and, and those who would use mathematical proofs to try to work their way into having faith or not. Continuing on the end of 94 and beginning of 95. If that fact came into the world as an absolute paradox, all that comes later would be of no help, because this remains for all eternity the consequence of a paradox, and thus just as definitively improbable as the paradox, unless it is assumed that the consequence, which after all are derived, gained retroactive power to transform the paradox. Right? The, the problem of mathematically solving something or, or wagering because something is probable is it's no longer paradoxical and, and you can't arrive at a conclusion of a paradox from a, a proof set, right? which would be just as acceptable as an assumption that a son retrieved retroactive power to transmission to his father. Right, You can't put back the evidence also of, of what we've seen as the probable outcome today onto an earlier generation or an earlier time period. Even if one considers the consequences purely logically, that is in the form of evidence, it still remains true that a consequence can be defined only as identical and homogeneous with its cause. Right? The, the reason for a consequence is it's growing out of the cause. It's gonna say it should be of the same type, of the same quality. Um, and, and maybe even identical in some ways, uh, but less of all having a sort of transforming power. To have this consequence in front of one's nose then is just as dubious an advantage as to have an immediate certainty of someone who takes the consequence immediately and directly as deceived as someone who has taken an immediate certainty from faith. I said, if you're gonna deny something based on mathematical proof or embrace it, then really, is there any difference? It's just, you know, sophistry at this point. It's not going to really make faith, which is what Kierkegaard is arguing for. Um, 
The advantage of the consequence seems to be that fact is supposed to have been naturalized little by little, that the consequences are going to be made manifest and are going to be known to people. To take a quick diversion at the very end of that footnote as well, we see this is the wagery is justifiable for it as man has not been in vain. It would have been made to look like a fool in the face of an honest earnestness of his conviction. What Epicurus says of the individual, individual's relation to death, that death is nothing. Right? This, this is a famous saying of, of Epicurus following Epicurus. Uh, and, and early hedonists as well, right? They would put this on rings and on mirrors that death is nothing to you. It says this holds with the relation of the probability and improbability. For when I am, it, death, is not. And when it, death is, then I am not, right? This is that argument that death is nothing because you're going to be changed. It's either going to be something or nothing. And so there's part of this idea too of, of probability that it, it's not that something you're in relation to. And therefore, the consequences that are being laid out already are also not anything that's going to benefit you or advantage you in any ways. Rather, continuing on at the bottom of page 95, the advantage of the consequence seems to be that that fact is supposed to have been naturalized little by little, that we'll have seen what has grown and developed out of this. If this is the case, if this is at all even thinkable, then the later generation plainly is in a position of advantage over the contemporary generation. And someone would even have to be very stupid to be able to talk about the consequence in this sense. And yet, romanticize about the good fortune of being contemporary with that fact and can appropriate that fact quite unabashedly without noticing the ambiguity of the awareness from which the offense can proceed as well as faith. Right? There's an advantage of coming later in that it is probable that you can see the effects that others having this notion of a faith and this leap have had upon them. You can learn and gain from what others have done. And so there's actually a greater advantage in this way that it is going to allow for greater awareness of the fact that you are untruth because you see where truth has manifest itself in others who are also untruth, to go back to his earlier distinctions. That fact, however, however, has no respect for domestication, is too proud to desire a follower who joins in the strength of the successful outcome of the matter, refuses to be naturalized under the protection of a king or a professor, as it is remains the paradox, and does not permit attainment by speculation. This fact is only for faith. It only makes a difference if you're also going to have this position of faith. If you're going to approach witnessing notions of truth as a grounds for faith, otherwise it's just speculation. It doesn't have any real meaning to you. And again, we return to the notion of the subjective and where you approach notions of the truth as opposed to it just being something that exists outside of you and somewhere else. In many ways, we can talk about this notion of faith being how one would approach the ideas of truth as we see in notions of pragmatism by Pierce, James, and Dewey. First paragraph down on 96. Now, faith certainly may become a person's second nature, but a person for whom it becomes a second nature must certainly have had a first nature inasmuch as faith became the second. That's why we use this phrase, right? It's second nature to you. Well, that means you also have a first nature. You have something else that's there first. If the fact is to be naturalized, then with respect to the individual, it is said that the individual is born with faith, that it is with his second nature, that there is a new identity that's going to be grown out of this. This is what faith does. It's efficacious in creation in this way. If we start our explanation on this premise, then every kind of nonsense begins to celebrate, for now the lid is off and the process cannot be stopped. Naturally, this nonsense must be fabricated by going further, for there truly was a good sense in Socrates' view, even though we abandoned it in order to discover what was projected earlier, right? If, if you already had this in you and you're not coming to something new, secondary in you, 
then he's like, you know, that we're starting to get a little crazy and maybe Socrates is right. But the whole venture of this is, can the truth be learned from a non-Socratic view? Can we learn the truth or simply re recollect it? We abandoned Socrates to have this experiment. And nonsense of that sort would certainly feel deeply insulted not to be much further ahead than the Socratic view. There is, in some sense, even the transmigration of souls, but to be born with one second nature is a second nature. That refers to a given historical fact in time is truly ultimate lunacy. You're not born with a second nature, otherwise it's simply your first nature. Socratically understood, the individual has existed before he came into existence and recollects himself. Thus, recollection is pre-existence, not recollection of pre-existence. His nature, then, because you've done this over and over again, your, your existence is that of recollection, right? His nature, the one nature for here, there is no question of the first and the second nature, is defined in continu continuity with itself. Here, however, everything faces forward and is historical. Thus, to be born with faith is just as plausible as to be born 24 years old. If someone born with faith could actually be pointed out, that someone would be a rarity more worthy of seeing than the barber uh, in Don Solasi, who tells of being born in the Nubin Budin, uh, even though no barbers and busybodies that would have ever been the dearest of all these little creatures, the supreme triumph of speculation. Those of us unfamiliar with this story, because it's not one that we're familiar with, right? It's a sailor's wife uh, in the New in uh in this naval quarters, had at one time brought 32 children in the world, gave birth to 32, was the size of an ordinary pregnant woman, but had 32 children. And then shortly thereafter, they were baptized and then all died. So this is the story that, again, is not something that's familiar to us. And it's not too important for this example that he's trying to draw from, but saying that this would be an odd thing to, to see anything like this happen. Or continuing on on the top of page 97, is this individual perhaps born with both natures simultaneously? Can you be born with two natures, right? Not, please note in such a way that the two natures go together to form a common human nature, but with two complete human natures, one of which presupposes something historical in between. Right. If you're going to be born with two natures, are we going to say that they're complementary? They work together. No, if they're identical in that they're both human natures, then we have this idea that one needs to come back a little bit later. In this case, he says, everything we projected in chapter one is thrown into confusion that we stand not in the Socratic, but in a confusion that not even Socrates would be able to terminate. It becomes a forward oriented confusion as much as in common with the backward-oriented confusion created by others. In other words, unlike Socrates, you're not satisfied with recollecting yourself as being prior to your coming into existence, but was in a hurry to go further, that is, recollected to those who have then become himself. If the fact has been naturalized, then birth is no longer birth, but it is also rebirth, such as that he who has never been is reborn when he is born which most of us again see this as problematic and is really what kierkegaard is arguing against he says there is this other possibility out there but it seems as absurd as anything else so just because it exists doesn't mean that it's likely or probable right for the individual life this means that the individual is born with faith for the human race, this means the same thing, so that the race, after the prevention of that fact, became altogether different race, and nevertheless is defined in continuity with the former. In that case, the race ought to take a new name, for faith, as it were now formulated as certainty, is not something inhuman, such as birth within a birth, or rebirth, but it certainly would become a fabulous monstrosity, if it were such as if we let the objection want it to be. And that just because this idea is possible doesn't mean it's probable or even likely or even something we would want. The advantage of the consequence 
is a dubious advantage for another reason, insofar as it is not a simple consequence of that fact. Let us appraise the advantage of the consequence as high as possible. Let us assume that this fact has completely transformed the world, has penetrated even the most insignificant trifle with its omnipresence. How did this take place? It certainly didn't occur in one single stroke, but occurred gradually, and gradually in what way? Presumably by every single generations relating all over again to that fact. Therefore, the middle term must be inspected so that the full strength of the consequence can be of benefit to someone only by a conversation. That you're only going to learn this through interacting with others. But many of you can say, cannot a misunderstanding also have consequences? Cannot an untruth also be as powerful? And has this not occurred in every generation? If all the generations were to entrust all the splendor of the consequences of the most recent generation as a matter of course, then the consequences are indeed a misunderstanding. So if this was based on untruth instead of truth, if it's lies that spread instead of veracity, then what does this mean? And Venice was built upon the sea, even though it was built in such a way that a generation finally came along that didn't notice this at all. And would it not be lamentable misunderstanding if that latest generation was so in error until the pilings began to rot and the city begins to sink? But humanly speaking, consequences built upon a paradox are built upon the abyss and the total content of the consequences, which is handed down to the single individual only under the agreement that it is by virtue a paradox is not to be passed on like real estate, since the whole thing is in suspense. All right. While the untruth can rot away the Ven Venetian peers, the offense is based upon a misunderstanding of the paradox, and this is somewhat suspended like the buildings of Venice, but over an abyss, not over water, and that it's still approaching the individual as you are right now. So it's not just based upon the words of others or the earlier construction, but it's also built upon where you see it now. It's an abyss that doesn't have any sort of support other than how you are going to approach it. So now the comparison. The second paragraph down, uh, he states that the first generation of secondary followers has the advantage of having the difficulty present. Right? This is the distinct advantage. They have that difficulty. They need to make this decision. Right? If I were to concur uh, to the latest generation, observing the first generation and seeing it almost collapsing under the terror to say, this is inconceivable, for the whole thing is not so heavy that one cannot pick it up and run with it. There, no doubt, would be someone who would reply, please, why do you not run with it? But just be sure that what you are running with is actually what is under discussion. Right? This becomes the advantage of that later generation. Right? If the latest generation gets to say, what are you going with? Are you going to take it? Just make sure you've got the right thing because this is what I'm inheriting. Right? We certainly do not dispute the fact that it is easy enough to run with the wind. The latest generation has the advantage of ease. Right? This is the advantage. The first generation has the advantage of the difficulty, but they have to make a decision immediately. The latest generation has the advantage of the conclusions of what have been borne out by those earlier decisions. But as soon as it discovers that this ease is the very dubiousness that begets the difficulty, then this difficulty will correspond to the difficulty of the terror and the terror will grip the latest generation just as primitively as it gripped that first generation of secondary followers. And both generations have this degree of terror. One is you need to make sure you make the right decision. And the second is you need to make sure you make the right decision, right? Both of which that first generation and second generation would have the same terror grip them. And this, of course, leads us to that whole question about, is there a follower at second hand at all? 
So this is the question now at hand. Before considering this question, he states, though, we shall make a few observations for orientation. A, if the fact is regarded as a simple historical fact, then being a contemporary counts for something, or to be as close as possible as to be able to assure oneself of the reliability of the contemporaries, right? Every historical fact is only a relative fact and therefore is entirely appropriate for the relative power time to decide the relative fates of people with respect to contemporary entity. Right? There, if we're talking about an event being historical, there's an advantage of, of being there or as close as you can to it. If I want to know more about Lincoln, it'd be to my advantage if I got to be there around Lincoln and go, oh, okay, this is actually how you operated in X, Y, and Z, or at least ask other people who knew Lincoln, hey, how did he act in this way? As generations go, you have to do more digging to find those research of primary accounts and, right? So there is an advantage for historical facts to be there at the moment. B, he continues, if that fact is an eternal fact, not just a historical fact, right? Then every age is equally close to it. But please note, not in faith, for faith and the historical are entirely commensurate. And thus it is only an accommodation, to use a less correct use of the language for me to use the word fact, which is taken from the historical. And if we're wanting to understand this event as a historical fact, then being there is important. If it's a historical fact, then everything is just as close. Because eternal facts are eternal. Everywhere we see this. C, if the fact is an absolute fact, or to define it even more exactly, if that fact is what we have set forth, then it is a contradiction for time to be able to appropriate the relations of people to it. That is, apportion them in a crucial sense, for whatever can be apportioned essentially by time is eo ipso not the absolute, because that would imply that the absolute itself is a cause in life, a status in relation to something else, whereas the absolute, although declinable in all the cavus of life, is continually the same and is continual relation of something else is continually the status absolutus, the absolute status. But the absolute fact is indeed also historical. If we pay no attention to that, then all of our hypothetical discussion is demolished, for then we are speaking only of an eternal fact. The absolute fact is a historical fact inasmuch as it is the object of faith. Now, notice what we're doing with faith here and, and this third category. We have historical, which being close to it matters. We have eternal, at which point, everything is equally the same distance. And then we have this absolute fact where the eternal is becoming historical. But what is it that's actually becoming historical? He's saying what's historical is this object of faith, at which point everyone is relating to it. We should be able to also draw some very clear connections between what Kierkegaard is arguing here and also Aquinas and his notions of faith. And you can draw very easy and clear connections in, in how this is going to be defined and understood. The historical aspect must indeed be accentuated, but not in such a way that it becomes absolutely divisive, decisive for individuals. For then we are back to A, towards the historical. But the historical must not be removed either, for then we only have the eternal fact. Next paragraph down on page 100, we get the answer to this question that we've been posed. Just as the historical becomes the occasion for the contemporary to become a follower by receiving the condition, please note from the God himself, as we've already defined in earlier discussions, because otherwise we return once again to the Socratic. So the report of the contemporaries becomes the occasion for everyone coming later to become a follower by receiving the condition. Please note again from the God himself. Now we shall begin. The person who through the condition becomes a follower receives the condition from the God himself. Right? Where does this condition come from? The condition is, again, from the God himself as opposed to an occasion to which being contemporary 
has value. You are the occasion for somebody else to learn something, but the condition for them to learn must be given by somebody else. This little distinction here is very important for Kierkegaard in this argument about the follower at second hand, right? Continuing on, uh, bottom of that paragraph there. Then what place is there for that question about the follower at second hand? For one, who has what one has from the God himself, obviously has it at first hand. And one who does not have it from the God himself is not a follower. So essentially, where do we have this idea of being a follower at second hand? Where could this come from? The answer is, there's not one. There's somebody who's an occasion for you to become a follower later. Um, but again, that's really coming from the God themselves. Right? Let us assume something different at the bottom of page 100. Let us assume that the contemporary generation of followers received the condition from the God. Now the succeeding generations are to receive the condition from these contemporaries. What would be the result? If we were to have an argument about being an actual follower at second, and what would the result of that be? We shall not divert attention by reflecting upon the historical uh, with the people of this new con uh, condition. Most likely, it would covet the report of those contemporaries of, as if everything depended upon that and thereby create a new confusion. No, the contemporary gives the condition to one who comes later. The later will come to believe in him. He receives the condition from him and thereby the contemporary becomes the object of faith for the one who comes later. Because the one from whom the single individual receives the condition is eo ipso, himself the object of faith and is the God. So if I'm giving you the condition, then I'm now what you're having faith in. And that would then make me the God in this equation. I'm that outside source of truth that's then making you see the truth. And this would be, again, you're not a secondary follower, but now a first-hand follower of somebody who is in this way the god but of course he says presumably such meaninglessness will be enough to frighten you away from this assumption right this isn't what he's wanting to argue for is that we all become gods when we teach somebody something else just because you're the occasion for somebody to learn would mean that you're the god so really the occasion to learn the truth must be beyond just that of other individuals but if the one who comes later also receives the condition from the God, then the Socratic relation will return. But please note, within the total difference consisting in the fact that the relation of the single individual to the God, that meaninglessness, however, is unthinkable, in a sense different from our starting, that the fact that the single individual's relation to the God are unthinkable, our hypothetical assumption of the fact that the single individual's relation to the God contains no self-contradiction, and thus thought can become preoccupied with itself, as is the strangest of all. And if it's going to be somebody else, then you have a different relation, and it's not the absolutely different. This is why you can't just say, I'm learning from other people, because those other people are also in a similar state to you. They're not absolutely different which is, again, part of this whole thought experiment on where he's come from. That meaninglessness consequence, however, contains a self-contradiction. It is not satisfied with uh, positing something unreasonable, which is our hypothetical assumption, but within this unreasonableness, it produces self-contradiction, that the God is the God for the contemporary, but the contemporary, in turn, is the God for a third. That this is a contradiction that we would have, that I have now become a god uh, in this way, just because I can teach you. Our project went beyond Socrates, only that it placed the god in relation to the single individual. But who indeed would dare uh, come to Socrates with such nonsense that a human being is a god in his relation to another human being? No, with a heroism that itself takes a boldness to understand, Socrates understood how one human being is related to another.
and yet the point is to acquire the same understanding within the formation as assumed, namely that the one human being, insofar as he is a believer, is not indebted to someone else for something, but is indebted to the God for everything. Again, the God needs to be the one that the faith is in and not a person, and it would go beyond the Socratic to make every person then the God. Top of 102. That this understanding is not easy will be seen without any difficulty. Not easy, especially when it comes to preserving this understanding continually. And anyone who begins to exercise himself in this understanding, no doubt will frequently enough catch himself in a misunderstanding as if he wants to become involved with others that he had better take care. But if he has understood it, he will also understand that there is not and cannot be any question of a follower at second hand. For the believer, and only he after all is a follower, continually has the autopsy of faith. He does not see with the eyes of others and sees only in the same uh, that every believer sees with these eyes of faith. This is the answer to this question about the follower at second hand. Everyone approaches the truth to the same God from the same position, with the same eyes, with the eyes of faith, even that first generation of contemporary followers, let alone the next generation are also contemporary followers. Everyone receives the condition from the God himself and therefore there is no follower at second hand. You may ask yourself the same question that Kierkegaard poses in the middle of 102. What then can a contemporary do for someone who comes later? He already kind of gave the answer for this, but let's see. A, he can tell someone who comes later that he himself has believed that fact. This actually is not a communication at all, but merely an occasion. You can give somebody say, hey, this has happened to me, and you're communicating this occasion. Or B, in this form, he can tell the content of the fact, a content that still is only for faith, in quite the same sense as colors are for sight and sound for hearing. In this form, he is able to do it in any other form. He is only talking nonsense and perhaps indulges the one who comes later to make up his own mind in continuity with idle chatter. So you're either giving the occasion because you're sharing and relating this notion of faith, or you're talking about it as a sort of fact, an outsider, and then they might come to it, but again, that would only be as chatter. Therefore, in what sense can the trustworthiness of a contemporary be of interest to somebody who comes later? And this is, this is also key to Kierkegaard's understanding of why there cannot be a follower at second hand. Whether he actually had the faith that he testified that he had is of no concern to those who come later, continuing on in 103. It is of no benefit to him and makes no difference to him in coming to faith himself. Only the person who receives the condition from the God, only that person believes. If he believes, because many good honest people here on the hill have believed, then he is a fool and essentially it is incidental whether he believes by virtue of his own view and perhaps widespread opinion of the faith of the good honest people or whether he believes a Munchausen or in this context a tall tale. Right? If the trustworthiness of the contemporaries to have any interest for him his interest must be in regard to something historical. What historical something? The historical that can be the object only for faith and cannot communicate by one person to another, that is. One person can communicate it to another, but please note, not in such a way that the other believes it. Whereas if he communicates it in the form of faith, he does his very best to prevent the other from adopting it directly. Right. What can you do? You can give information, you can relate it. What trustworthiness is there that you're telling the truth? None. Because again, otherwise you're that object of faith, which is then just a tall tale and it doesn't mean anything. It's not significant. 
you're a fool, as he says, but rather you're relating an event as the occasion to let somebody else have this. If the fact of which we speak of is a simple historical fact, then the historiographer's scrupulous accuracy would be of great importance. This is not the case here, for faith cannot be distilled from even the finest detail. The heart of the matter is the historical fact that the God has become human form. And in other historical details are not even as important as they would be if the subject were a human being instead of the God. Lawyers say that a capital crime absorbs all of these lesser crimes. So also with faith, its absurdity completely absorbs minor matters. The idea of the incarnation itself is of the greatest import that everything else is subsumed under this idea, according to Kierkegaard. By the way, this is also a strong relation to the rise of Christology in the 19th century following works like others of Friedrich Schleiermacher, to whom Kierkegaard was at least somewhat indebted to for some of his argument here. However, continuing on page 104, it does matter very much if by means of a petty-minded calculation someone wants to offer faith to the highest bidder. It matters so much that he would never come to faith. Next paragraph down on 104. If we wish to state in the briefest possible way the relation of a contemporary to someone who comes later without, however, sacrificing correctness for brevity, then we can say, by means of the contemporary's report, the occasion, the person who comes later believes by virtue of the condition he himself receives from the God. So this is what it is. What do you give somebody else who comes later? The occasion. The contemporary's report is the occasion for the one who comes later just as the immediate contemporary is the occasion for the contemporary. And if the report is what it ought to be, a believer's report, it'll then be the occasion of the same ambiguity of awareness that he himself had occasioned by immediate contemporaryanity. You're gonna know that you're there in this event if you're indeed sharing it in the same way that it was received. If the report is not of this nature, then either it is by a historian and doesn't really deal with the object of faith, or it is by a philosopher and does not deal with the object of faith. The believer, however, passes the report in such a way that no one can accept it directly and immediately, for the words, I believe it, are very disquieting. Bottom of 104, beginning of 105. There is no follower at second hand, very clearly stated, questions resolved, is there a follower at second hand? No. The first and the latest generation are essentially alike, except the later generation has the occasion in the report of the contemporary generation, whereas the contemporary generation has the occasion in the immediate contemporaryanity and therefore owes no generation anything. But this immediate contemporaryanity is merely the occasion, and the strongest expression of this is that the follower, if he understood himself, would have to wish that he would be terminated by the departure of the God from the earth. But someone may be saying, how very curious. I have read your discussion to the end and really not without some interest. And I have been pleased to find no slogans, no invisible writing. But how do you twist and turn just as Saft always ends up in the pantry? You always mix in a little phrase that is not your own, and that disturbs because of the recollection it prompts. Once again, we get this sort of dialectic that emerges here in the writing, where there's the audience now responding, hey, you know, I, I followed your argument, I kind of like it, but you, you kind of drop little nuggets along the way or, or something else that, that always kind of causes its own concern. This idea that it is the follower's advantage that the God depart is in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John. Yet whether this was deliberate or not, whether you wanted to give me a comment of particular effect by casting it in this form of the matter of how it stands in the contemporary's advantage, which I originally was inclined to rate very high, seems to have come considerably reduced since there can be no question of a follower at second hand. 
or in other words, amounts to the same thing that you're essentially alike. Not only this, but according to what you just said, immediate contemporaneity, considered as an advantage, becomes so dubious that the most that it can be said of is that it seems to become an advantage to terminate it. This means that in the immediate state, that no doubt has its significance and cannot be omitted without, as you would say, returning to the Socratic. But nevertheless, it does not have an absolute significance for contemporary entity. Therefore, he is not divested of the essential by the termination, since on the contrary, he gains by it. Although if he had not been, he would be lose everything and return once again to the Socratic. This is the basic argument that was being made before of why there cannot be a follower at second hand. The retort, once again, is very eloquently spoken, I would say, if modestly did not forbid me. For you speak as I myself would speak. Yes, that is just how it is. Immediate contemporary entity is by no means decisive advantage. If one thinks it through and it is not inquisitive or in a hurry, does not wish, indeed does not wishfully strain at the leash, but like the barber in Greece, to risk his life at once by being the first to tell an extraordinary news, and it is not so foolish as to regard such a death as a martyr's death. Immediate contemporary entity is so far from being an advantage that the contemporary must expressly wish its termination, lest one be tempted to run around and see with its physical eyes and to hear the mortal ears of which has been a wasted effort, lamentably, yes, and a perilous chore. But this, as you no doubt have observed in yourself, actually belongs to another exposition, where the question would be of the advantage of the contemporary believer, having become a believer, could have from his contemporary entity here, we all are considering only the extent of the immediate contemporary entity makes it easier for someone who becomes a believer. Someone who comes later cannot be tempted in this way, for he has only the contemporary's report, which insofar as the report is the inhibitive form of faith. Therefore, if one who comes later understands himself, he must wish the contemporary's report to be not too uh, prolix, and above all, to be couched in so many books that they could fill the whole world. Another reference here to the Gospel of John. In immediate contemporary entity, there is a restlessness that ends only when it is said, it is finished. Without, however, the elimination of the historical and the relaxation from the everything is Socratic. This is my opinion too on the bottom of 106, but you must likewise consider that the God himself is a reconciler, that there is this reconciliation of natures in this way. Would he bring about a reconciliation with some human beings such that their reconciliation with him would make their difference from all others blatantly flagrant? That would indeed bring conflict. Would the God allow the power of time to decide whom he would grant this favor? Or would it not be worthy of the God to make this reconciliation equally difficult for every human being at every time and at every place? Equally difficult because no human being is capable of giving himself the condition, but neither is he to receive it from another human being and thereby produce a new dissension. Equally difficult then, but also equally easy in as much as the God gives it. And this is the, the other notion here of what it is to be a follower in this way, that every decision is going to be a difficult one. Everyone's going to require this leap and this transformation of not to be too as into to be, as was mentioned earlier. And this is equally difficult for everybody, regardless of the generation you come from. This, you see, is why I, at the beginning, I considered my project to be a godly project. And I can still consider it to be that, without, however, being indifferent to any human objection. Since, on the contrary, I once again ask you if you have any legitimate protest to make, to present it. And what, what, objections would you have? Down another six to eight lines or so in 107. I am well aware that the contemporary generation 
must really sense and suffer profoundly the pain involved in the coming to existence of such a paradox, or as you put it, in the gods planting himself in human life. But gradually the new order of things must succeed in pushing its way through the uh, victoriously, and finally will come to the happy generation, that which songs of joy harvest the fruits and sown in tears of that first generation. But this jubilant, triumphant generation that goes through life with singing and ringing is not quite different from that first and that earlier generations, right? Is there a difficult and difference, and what would that be? Says it is different, and perhaps so different that it doesn't even retain the equality that constitutes the condition for our speaking of it. The condition, such as that generation's difference, would frustrate my efforts to achieve equality. But again, the difficulty here is that we're wanting to make equal, and that if everything is easy, then it wouldn't actually be equal. This is, again, to return to Kierkegaard's project of making life more difficult, making Christianity more difficult, that there won't be this exuberant, we're all simply here and, and are done with the work and the effort, and that this becomes the difficulty here. Now, truly, at the very end of 107, he says, if faith ever has the notion of advancing en masse in triumph, it will not need to give anyone permission to sing satirical songs because it would do no good for it would forbid everyone. Even if people were struck dumb, this mad procession would involve shrill laughter similar to the mocking sounds of the nature of the Salome. And the faith that celebrates triumphantly is the most ludicrous of all. If the contemporary generations of believers did not find time to celebrate triumphantly, then no generation finds it. For the task is identical. The faith is always in conflict, but as long as there is in conflict, there is the possibility of defeat. Remember, the stance of every human being at the beginning is to be untruth. Therefore, you're not going to have a generation where everyone is in truth. That it must be a difficult transition, there must be a leap, and therefore there is no secure victory for any generation who has this. Therefore, with regard to faith, one never celebrates triumphantly ahead of time, that is, never in time. For when there is the time to compose songs of victory or the opportune occasion to sing them. Continuing about halfway down 108. What the later so-called believer did was even worse than the contemporary sought in vain for the God, as mentioned in chapter two, when he didn't want the God to have exposed himself in lowliness and contempt. For the so-called believer who came later would himself not even be satisfied with lowly poverty and contempt, but the contending foolishness, but no doubt that he'd be willing to believe if they were done and singing and ringing, presumably the God would not, could not say to such a one that he said to the contemporary, so then you love only the omnipotent, one who does miracles, not the one who has abased himself uh, in equality with you. This is something uh, we do in our own day, have completely disregarded uh, by canceling and, and canceling the principal contradiction without perceiving what Aristotle indeed emphasized, that the thesis that the principle of contradiction is canceled is based upon the principle of contradiction, since otherwise the opposite thesis that it is not canceled is equally true. Continuing on 109, about three lines down on that next paragraph. I do not deny this, nor shall I conceal the fact that I did it deliberately, and that in the next section of this pamphlet, if ever I do write it, I intend to call the matter by its proper name and clothe the issue in its historical costume. If I ever do write a second section, because the pamphlet writer, such as I, am in uh, no seriousness, as you presumably will hear about me, why then should I now, in conclusion, pretend seriousness in order to please people by making a rather big promise? This is only a frivolous exercise. It's only a thought project, as he mentioned at the very beginning. This is just a pamphlet, and maybe more later, but otherwise it is what it is. Yet it is not difficult to perceive what the historical costume of the next section would be. 
as it is well known, Christianity is the only historical phenomenon that despite the historical, indeed precisely by means of the historical, has wanted to be the single individual's point of departure for the eternal consciousness, has wanted to interest him otherwise than merely historically, has wanted to base his happiness in relation to something historical. No philosophy, for it is only for thought. No mythology, for this is only for the imagination. No historical knowledge, for that is only of memory, has ever had this idea, of which is a connection, one can say, with all multiple meanings, that it did not arise in any human heart. To a certain extent, however, I have wanted to forget this, and, employing the unrestricted judgment of hypothesis, I have assumed that the whole thing was a whimsical idea of my own, one that I didn't wish to abandon before I had thought it through. The monks never finished narrating this, the history of the world because they always began with the creation of the world. If in discussing the relation between Christianity and philosophy, we begin by narrating what was said earlier, how shall will we ever finish, but ever manage to begin? For history just keeps on growing. If we begin with that great thinker, the sage Pontius Pilate, who in his own way merits a good deal of gratitude from Christianity and philosophy, even if he didn't invent meditation. And if, before beginning with him, we have to wait for one who's, or two decisive books, then what we have already announced with authority several times, how shall we ever manage to begin? We are going to begin with that same question that Pontius Pilate has said, what is truth? Instead, we're doing it from a slightly different way. Instead of just asking, what is the truth? As Pilate did, we're going to ask, how can I approach the truth? That this is the labor of this project. And it'll never get to the end because the end keeps on going. And yet to learn the truth is always going to be done through the same method. There will be no follower at second hand. You begin with the idea that the truth must be something outside of yourself, otherwise, indeed, you already possess it, and that we need to be doing this from a non-Socratic point of view. And while there are many other possibilities, this is the one that Kierkegaard has advanced as a possibility on how the truth can be learned, and therefore giving us that answer of what is the truth.